Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to this Caribbean semester presentation. Those of you in Corley Auditorium in Webster Hall and those of you watching by Zoom, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Michael Wood, who will be making three presentations all about Cuba today. Michael earned his undergraduate degrees in finance and history, as well as a master's degree in history from the University of Alabama. And then he went to Texas Christian University to pursue his PhD studies. Fate brought him back to the University of Alabama where he teaches sports studies courses as an instructor in the Department of American Studies. His research deals primarily with international cultural encounters between the United States and Latin America. Currently, his work focuses on American football games played between teams from the U.S. South and Havana during the first half of the 20th century. Michael has traveled to Cuba four different times conducting his research, even once as an undergraduate. As I mentioned, he's giving three presentations today at 11 o'clock, he'll be speaking on the Cuban national pastime, a brief history of Cuban baseball. And then at 12 noon, he'll be speaking on U.S.-Cuba relations. So please join me in welcoming Michael Wood to the stage. All right, thank you. Um, Thank you, Chad. Uh, I want to also thank Brian for all his help with uh, the arrangements. Um, and it's an honor and a privilege to be able to, to come and speak with uh, you today. I, um, again, you're, you're, if you come to all three, you're probably going to be sick of me by the end of the day. Uh, and you, you might hear some things repeated uh, a couple of times because I, I try to put things into context. And by putting it into context, you know, we have to put it into U.S.-Cuban relations context. Uh, so there's going to be bits that are going to reoccur um, over, overall uh, today. All right. So I want to thank everybody who's in, in attendance today in person. And I, don't, I can't see anybody on Zoom, but I assume there are people on Zoom uh, to, tuning into this. Uh, and all right, let's just, let's just get into this. Um, all right, so the title of this lecture is, is Beyond Baseball, uh, Cuban Sports and International Competitions. When we think of Cuba, and in the second lecture, I'm going to focus on baseball and specifically. Probably the, the first sport that comes to your mind will be baseball. Their dominance in baseball, Cuban players coming to the United States, playing in the major leagues. Uh, and I, this, this lecture, or this talk, it's, it's not really a lecture. I have a couple of, of examples here uh, that I want to bring up. That I, I want to expand beyond baseball, go beyond baseball, and show some of um, sports that, that you know, people in Cuba played, especially um, well, during the, the first half of the 20th century and then after the revolution, how things change after the revolution. And... In particular, look at it in terms of national identity, uh, of, of how international, international competitions play a role in, in, in forming national identity. All right, so let's, let's jump into what I have prepared, all right? Um, this may seem like out of left field, but uh, the Tokyo Olympics were scheduled for this year. They were, Clearly, they were postponed for, because of the, the COVID uh, epidemic. Uh, they're postponed to next year. We'll see how things turn out next year. Um, but I, I bring up the Olympics because the Olympic Games are and it, uh, probably our most recognizable, most familiar uh, international competition, uh, you know, international athletic competition uh, that, that really comes to mind that we're familiar with. Uh, and... You know, the Olympic Games, you know, they're a great example of an international sporting event, but they're also a, a good entry point into studying national identity. Uh, all right, so I, I want to put some of this into the, the context of sports and international relations. Uh, even though the revival of, of the Olympic Games were, were built on the myth that 
Uh, the games themselves and sports were apolitical. They're not. Uh, sports are inherently political. Uh, at the basic level, the, the study of sports is the study of people, of people using their bodies, people working in cooperation, people competing against one another and themselves at times. Uh, and we also get to see human excellence through sports, athletic achievement, uh, you know, also uh, realizing dreams and those sorts of, of you know, kind of broader, um, broader events. Um, but through, the, through sports, we, we can also see how people view themselves, how they see their opponents, uh, how we can uh, observe power dynamics, uh, how, how we can uh, observe issues of inclusion and exclusion. Uh, who, who plays? Who gets to play? Who doesn't get to play? Who supports these sports? Uh, uh, who, who supports the encounters uh, and why? And in a lot of the stuff that I do with uh, the study of sports, cultural, uh, cultural history, cultural studies, uh, I look at, at sports and, and uh, use frameworks, analytical frameworks like, you know, looking at it through race, class, and gender, and, you know, broadening at, it out to international relations in, in, in this context. Because international relations and international competition adds another layer of complexity on sports and, and competitions. Uh, you know, the, the athletic competitions, the international competitions, uh, serve as forums for political engagement. Uh, and also, and I'm, I'm going to really focus in on this, uh, serve as points where uh, national consciousness form, national consciousness and acceptance, um, you know, those, those, uh, that, those national identity formation. Um, international uh, power dynamics become apparent uh, and when we look at the United States and Cuba, that is, that's obvious uh, when, we, when we examine uh, international competitions between the U.S. and Cuba. And again, uh, we'll, we'll get into that context as we go along. Um, international competitions can form, like, like I mentioned before, collective national identity. Uh, I borrow some of, of the, from the, the work of Benedict uh, Anderson's Imagine Communities. Uh, this, this idea of, of nation building through internet, uh, imagined communities, individuals from different segments of populations, and oftentimes conflicting uh, segments of, of populations, uh, finding common cause and, and forging common bonds through, through these shared experiences of uh, identifying themselves with a team. Uh, everyone identify themselves with a team, that team represents the, the nation. So you start to have everyone identify themselves with that nation, and sports play a role in that. Uh, there's, it's not only sports, but sports play a, a good uh, major role, well, a significant role uh, in that. All right, so the, the two examples I have before the revolution uh, that I want to talk about are American football games, what I, what I focus on. Uh, I was really tempted to just make this entire talk only about American football in Cuba, but I, I thought that might have been you know, taking advantage of, of the situation and not showing you the, the broader scope of things. Um, so we're going to look at American football, and we're going to also look at boxing. Um, but before we do that, let's, let's look at what, what you know, U.S.-Cuba relations early 20th century, well, late 19th century, early 20th century, what shapes uh, the, the overall context of, of these international competitions in, in American football and boxing. All right, so with, with Cuba, uh, geographic proximity, among other um, you know, various reason, reasons, the United States and Cuba have had a long history of contact, uh, trade, and, and other relations with one another. Uh, Cuba was a, a Spanish colony until the end of the 20th century. Uh, from the, the 1860s to, to the 1890s, various factions in Cuba waged a series of arms, co armed conflicts against Spain, you know, part of an independence movement. And then towards the end of, of the 1890s, 1898 in particular, 
the United States gets involved. Uh, they intervene, or at least this is my view, they intervene in this, this uh, Cuban War of Independence and launch a, a broader war against Spain. Uh, and we, we know it better as the Spanish-American War. And there are other interpretations of uh, that war that, that bring Cubans, bring the Filipinos into uh, the context as well, because that, the U.S., well, the Spanish-American War was a, a global war, a global war, and at its core was, was U.S. intervention in, into Cuba, uh, in the Cuban independence uh, conflict. Um, the United States intervened, like I said, as an ally of, of the Cuba, Cuban faction, uh, but afterwards the U.S. hung around. Uh, the United States uh, had a, a military occupation of Cuba from 1899 through 1902. Uh, the 1902, 1902 was, was uh, the, the beginning of the, the Cuban Republic because uh, the, the passage of the broader adoption of, of the Cuban Constitution that included the Platt Amendment, something that was um, for, well, yeah, it forced on them by the United States that limited Cuban sovereignty. Uh, so that the United States had rights to intervene uh, militarily into Cuba, had, had rights over Cuban foreign affairs, uh, and also the establishment of uh, the Guantanamo Bay Naval Base was part of the, the Platt Amendment. So as you might understand, you, know, you, you, you can definitely have empathy with the Cuban side here that for off and on for about 30 years, Cuba's waging an armed conflict against Spain for independence. The U.S. intervenes, and then what comes out after that is another neo-colonial relationship with the United States. You know, you know, there's, there's Cuban sovereign, limited sovereignty, uh, and that, that forms the basis of political fractures in Cuba internally and also shapes U.S. Cuban, the U.S.-Cuban relationship of one of the U.S. in a dominant position, Cuba in, a, um, in uh, the, the lesser position of a, a more colonial relationship, even though there was no formal annexation. All right, so that, that gives you an idea of, of what, what's going on with that. Now, Cuban identity. Cuban identity begins to, to form in the late 19th century uh, through the, the wars with, with Spain, the, the armed conflicts, the, the independence movements. Uh, you begin to have Cubans in, in Spain not look at themselves as Spanish subjects anymore, but as Cubans first, Cuban nationalists. Uh, and that carries on uh, into the, the Cuban Republic of, of you know, Cuban nationalists. And in, in effect, with this, this shift from Spain to the United States in a neo-colonial relationship, uh, the, the adversary for, for the Cubans go from Spain to the United States. So international, uh, international competitions, athletic competitions between Cuba, people from Cuba and the United States, uh, have those layers of meaning uh, laid on them, especially after, after independence, after 1902. All right, so hopefully that, that provides a, a base for us to start looking at examples. Uh, the first example I want to look at is, is from football, from my, the, the main part of, of my, uh, my research. Uh, the example I chose was a game between Club Atletico de Cuba, the Cuban Athletic Club, uh, versus Tulane University. This, this game took place on January 1st, 1910. This wasn't the first football game played between a U.S. and Cuban team, but this is the first game that the Cuban team won. Uh, the, the Cuban team, the, the CAC, wins this game um, 11 to nothing. Uh, and by all accounts, both U.S. newspaper accounts, even the Tulane student newspaper accounts uh, of this game, the, the Cubans outplayed Tulane. Uh, so we, we began to have especially the, the coverage after this game, began to, to layer importance on this victory, uh, that, that the CAC's victory against Tulane was not just the club's victory against uh, their opponent, but Cuba's victory against the United States. Uh, in effect, 
a Cuban team playing an American sport and beating Americans at their own game. That was part of it. And this, this, this was monumental, um, or at least I consider it as monumental, even though a lot of this tends to be pushed aside. A lot of this history tends to be put as, pushed aside. And hopefully, hopefully when this book manuscript comes out, gets completed and gets published, uh, it will raise more awareness to these games. Uh, but American football encounters between U.S. and Cuba from 1910 going forward refer back to the CAC's victory, refer back to, in effect, you know, we, we have remember the main, re remember the two-lane game, remember what, what's, what's possible with uh, Cuban, Cuban teams against American teams. So I, I'm, I wanted to bring this example and bring this up into uh, you know, uh, a victory on the gridiron, uh, a Cuban team against an American team, a uh, U.S. team, uh, and how that becomes, especially in the newspapers, um, you know, brought into a, a larger national identity with that football team. So this is one of... Um, by my last count, uh, about 69 American football games played between U.S. and Cuban teams uh, from 1899 through 1959. And for the most part, the U.S. teams win. But when, when the Cuban teams, especially the CAC, the CAC goes on a run and, and defeats several American teams, it's always brought into the context of this is a win for Cuba. This is, this is countering negative stereotypes against Cubans. This is countering the, the underlying argument for the Platt Amendment to begin with. All right, so that, that's part of, of that example. The next example I want to bring up is from the 1920s going into the 1930s. The boxer you see here is Kid Chocolate. This is a, an image from uh, a, a picture I, I took when I was in Cuba of uh, the Kid Chocolate's gym. Uh, that doesn't exist anymore, uh, by the way. Uh, I, I took this, this image, uh, I want to say in, in 2016, it might have been 2017. But since then, a uh, European hotel group um, bought that building and this is gone. Uh, they're remodeling it into a, a luxury hotel, which with with COVID and, and everything, kind of puts everything into flux, whether or not it's going to succeed or not. But I wanted to bring that up because uh, this, this was Kid Chocolate's gym that he started when he, he retired uh, his training. So let's, let's talk about Kid Chocolate a little bit. Uh, Ch Kid Chocolate, was, his, his name was uh, El, Elgilio uh, Sardinas Montav, Montavlo. Uh, I'm going to call him Sardinas or um, Kid Chocolate from here forward. Uh, was born in, in Havana in 1910. Uh, his father was uh, a public works laborer. Uh, laborer. His, his mother was a washerwoman. He was basically, you know, he's, he's a black Cuban coming from working class, working poor neighborhood in Havana. Uh, his father dies when he's five years old. Uh, and after, after his father dies, Sardinius gravitates towards boxing. Uh, his, his older brothers participated in boxing, and so uh, he, he went, he starts to go to uh, the, the, the gyms and, and begins to uh, follow his, his brother's career. His brother's nickname was Chocolate, uh, and so when, it, when he's 11 years old in, in 1922, uh, Kid Chocolate, you know, the kid part is like little Chocolate, you know, because his brother's the big one. Um, enters into boxing and, uh, you know, at 11 years old, wins, wins his first tournament. And again, you know, shows, shows promise as, as a boxer from a very young age. He hangs around that gym and, and continues to, to build a reputation uh, in amateur boxing locally in Havana until uh, 1928. And in, in 1928, uh, boxing promoters from, from New York City uh, see potential out of, of Kid Chocolate and bring him to, to New York City and get him involved in the New York City boxing uh, culture uh, that, that had developed since 1920. Uh, 
Uh, a little bit about uh, Kid Chocolate. He's, as you can see, he's kind of a slight guy. He's, he's not a heavyweight. Uh, he fought as a uh, super welterweight. Uh, he's in the, the, the lighter division. So uh, he, he tends to not get the same press as, say, Jack Dempsey uh, and others that were in the, the heavyweight uh, division. But Kid Chocolate rises in the ranks in New York City. Uh, he, he's successful there. Um, you know, he, he fights on the undercards that, at, at games that, or boxing matches that, that take place at Ebbets Field in, in Brooklyn, at the Polo Grounds, uh, the, the home of the, the New York Giants at that time. So, you know, big baseball stadiums. Uh, he's, he's not the headliner, but he's part of the cards that are, that are fighting at, in these, these you know, main events, these large boxing events in New York City. He's also, in the 1920s, Madison Square Garden becomes the center of boxing, well, in America, if not worldwide. And Kid Chocolate was, was a, a featured boxer at Madison Square Garden, late 20s, going into the 1930s as well. Uh, so he, he you know, has this, this humble origin in, in, uh, in Havana, goes, turns pro, goes to the United States. Now, when he goes to the United States, the press in Cuba follows his career. Uh, they print newswires, U.S. newswire reports of his boxing matches. They um, print correspondence with boxing promoters and, and boxing, um, I guess you could say experts, but they're probably professional gamblers uh, from, from New York City. And all of it is, is praising Kid Chocolate's talent and his his wins, particularly if you, if you look at the, the political cartoon, this cartoon that appeared in uh, a, a Cuban magazine, as you see here, or hopefully you can see, the, the, the caption under it says, uh, it, it's in Spanish, but it says indigestion from chocolate. And you see piles of white, white boxers and a Cuban flag on top. Uh, so you, you can see that how Kid Chocolate's wins in the United States, and in this case, layering race on top of it, uh, win against white competition in the United States are wins for Cuba. And again, layering race onto it, win for the idea of, of you know, racial equality, race, racial opportunity in Cuba. Uh, he becomes kind of a symbol of that in the 1920, late 20s going into the 1930s. He's, he becomes a national hero uh, during this time. Uh, in um, August 1929, uh, Kid Chocolate defeats Al Singer at the polo grounds. When he goes home, he gets mobbed. Uh, he, he arrives at, in Havana Harbor by seaplane. You know, it's a pretty dramatic entrance. Uh, and there were thousands of people there to greet him. So many people that on one pier, one pier collapsed, causing injuries. Uh, the, the police basically just had, couldn't control the, the, the crowd that was mobbing, uh, that was wanting to see this, this national hero, someone who is achieving, uh, you know, winning boxing matches in the United States against U.S. competition. After that, he goes and gets... Uh, uh, an official greeting from, from the, the mayor of Havana, uh, an official uh, reception. And you know, in 1929, the, the president of Cuba at the time, Geraldo Machado, uh, even called him the most popular uh, Cuban uh, alive at that time. And uh, we'll, we'll talk more about Machado a little bit later. Uh, that, that's saying something if Machado raises somebody in higher esteem than himself. Uh, so kind of gives you an idea. He's a, he's a national celebrity in, in 1929, uh, becomes a, a symbol of Cuban opportunity, uh, of, of the potential of Cubans, and in this case, the potential of black Cubans. In 1931, Kid Chocolate wins, wins the first heavyweight, well, not heavyweight, first boxing championship. Um, of course, he's not a heavyweight, but uh, the first boxing championship, you can see in, in the, the second... Um, cartoon there, uh, illustration. Uh, Kid Chocolate wins, wins the first, is the first Cuban to hold a world boxing championship. Uh, in July 1931, he beats Benny Bass uh, in seven rounds to win the World Junior Lightweight Championship. 
Uh, a year later, he wins the, the Super Welterweight Championship. So he, he holds two titles in 1931 and 1932. And again, that, that even, you know, this, this is reaching the pinnacle. You know, he's a Cuban is the best in the world at boxing at that level. And he's, again, you know, tied, his success is shared, shared by the broader Q, Cuban population. After 1933, um, 1933, he loses these titles. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he's an active professional boxer, so he's, he's fighting a lot. Uh, he loses the titles, and uh, things begin to sour. Uh, the, basically, the, the boxing press says that he's over the hill, and you see a little bit of a decline. He, he retires in 1938, again, goes back to Cuba, and opens up a, a boxing training gym, and... Uh, from 38 through 1959, basically, ekes out a living uh, as a boxing trainer. There's a lot of things that are going on in Cuba at that time that make things complicated for everybody. Um, but in 39, after the Cuban Revolution, uh, the, the, the new revolutionary government gives Kid Chocolate a, a pension for the rest of his life. So 1959 through 1988, uh, he earns a, has a government pension, and in effect, it's, you're a national hero, you shouldn't have to want, you shouldn't have to worry with this. Uh, and, you know, so you, you see the transition from pre-revolution to revolution, and then Kid Chocolate's fame and his, his identification with that Cuban national identity remains. You know, it, it, it weathers uh, the, the change in government, the government system. So I mentioned Machado, and I'm not going to go too much into this because I'm, I'm paying attention to the time, and I want to, I want to leave, leave some time open for, for questions. Um, but, all right, so uh, in short, uh, Machado becomes uh, increasingly autocratic, increasingly anti-democratic. There's a revolution, a revolt that takes place late 30, or early 30s into 1933, uh, 33 is the year of the sergeant's revolt. Valencio Batista becomes, well, rises to power. He's not, he's not officially president or anything, but he's, he's the head of the military, and the military controlled Cuba from mid-30s into 1940. Uh, there's a bit of an interim, 40 to, to 52. Uh, Batista comes back in 52 and establishes a dictatorship, and that's that's the, the impetus of uh, the motivation behind the Cuban Revolution to overthrow Batista's anti-democratic dictatorship and to, in effect, restore democracy in Cuba. All right, so I bring all that up because in 1959, Cuban Revolution successful, overthrow. There's a couple of years that are kind of in flux. You know, there's, there's, not a, there's not a situation where uh, the Cuban, you know, Fidel Castro and, and his, his group wins the Cuban Revolution and automatically it goes socialist. It takes a little time. Uh, there's there's 52 in, in, or 59 and 60. Uh, Cuba's in flux. Uh, they're, they're passing reforms, but the reforms become increasingly, um, well, increasingly nationalistic and increasingly socialist. And again, there, it's, it's a complicated situation that we'll go into later. Um, but in 1961, at the end of the year in 1961, uh, December 1961 is when Fidel Castro officially declares the Cuban Revolution a socialist revolution. And it's in that year that Cuban sports are reorganized. Reorganized under a, a government system, a, a government ministry. The, uh, I'm just going to call it ENDER, but it's, it's the... It's, uh, Instituto Nacional de Deportes, Educación Física, uh, Física y Re Recreación. So it's uh, the, the National Institute of Sports, Physical Education, and Recreation. Uh, you know, Top-down government control of all sports in Cuba. Uh, reorganization of sports. And with this, it's, it's on the model that the Soviet Union used. It's on the model that Eastern European countries, the, the Eastern Bloc countries used. Uh, in 1961, Fidel Castro sent uh, so, some government ministers to East Germany to learn their system and bring it back. Uh, so beginning with, with the reorganization under Ender, uh, there's an expansion of 
sports academies, and pretty much all of organized sports. Now, there's, there's kind of a broader physical education uh, that, that's geared towards just the physical health of, of the country, uh, democratizing um, sport, but also feeding into um, military preparedness, especially after the Bay of Pigs. Uh, that everybody needs to be fit because it looks like the United States is going to invade at any point. Uh, that's, that's the perception in 61, late 1961. So that, that becomes part of this, this reorganization of Cuban sports. Uh, and I, I bring all this up, uh, this, this reorganization, because after 61, Cuban sports become oriented towards international competitions specifically. Sports are used as a tool of foreign policy uh, in, a, in the same way that the United States used sports as a tool of foreign policy in the 50s and 60s uh, in the broader Cold War context, uh, the same way that the Soviet Union used sports as uh, a, a political tool. And Cuba is entering into this, and they're, they're modeling it on the Soviet model. You know, they're, they're using that, and they're, they're getting a lot of help with, with that with, with the Soviet uh, Soviet program in the Eastern Bloc, um, state sponsored, state organized. And again, uh, there's, there were some sports academies before the, before the Cuban Revolution, uh, particularly boxing and, and that not really academies, it was just kind of like training, uh, boxing and baseball. There were some, some of boxing and baseball type academies. But after 61, there are academies dedicated to specific, uh, you know, Olympic sports like, uh, weightlifting, uh, track and field, and, and um, volleyball, and those sorts of, of training academies, because it was, it was a, a means for getting the best, best Cuban athletes on the national team, because national team wins are wins for Cuba, and in this case, wins for the revolution. And I, I'm going to end here with this slide, because they have success in this. Um, to use a boxing term, they, they punch above their weight class, uh, beginning 60s, 70s, all the way through the 1990s. Uh, the, the gentleman here, again, I'm, I'm trying to keep boxing in this. Again, I, I don't know if it's guilt of, of me studying football and not wanting to lean heavily with football, but uh, boxing's important uh, with this. Uh, this gentleman wins the heavyweight championship of, of the uh, heavyweight gold medal in the, the 72 Olympics, the 76 Olympics and the 1980 Olympics. A heavyweight boxer from Cuba wins three consecutive gold medals. Uh, and they have success in boxing, they have success in uh, track and field. And there's, there's other success like volleyball, water polo, some swimming and diving uh, a little bit, and baseball. Uh, and you know, from, from the 1960s, well, late 60s going into the all the way through the 1990s, Cuba wins disproportionate amount of, of medals, you know, place in the Olympics and in the Pan American Games and the Central and, Q and uh, Caribbean Games. Uh, they, they rival the success of the United States in the Pan American Games and uh, become a dominant force in the Central American and uh, Caribbean Games because, again, they're, they're re reorienting sports to as a, a political tool, as a tool of foreign policy. Wins, gold medals, silver medals, bronze medals, placing are wins for the revolution. And I'll, I'll, I'll say one more thing before I turn it over to uh, the questions. Uh, 1990, well, 89, 90, 91, the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the end of communism in Europe ushers in a, a period in, in Cuba called the special period because after, after 61, Cuba had a very close relationship with the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc. They were the major trading partner. Uh, they were the, the major partner for Cuban goods. And overall, there's an economic collapse in Cuba, especially food. Uh, this, in, in the 1990s, uh, the special period was a period of food shortages, of fuel shortages, and that translates to sports as well. Uh, there's there's a, a de-emphasis on sports. 
Well, I mean, they're, they're still emphasizing sports and international competition, but they don't have the resources to pour into it that they did from the 1960s through the 1990s. So there's, there's a retreat that you see from, so from the 90s to the present of Cuban, Cuban success in international competitions. And it's reflective of what happened globally uh, with, with the fall of the Soviet Union. And I'll, I'll leave it there uh, because I'm gonna talk about other, other stuff uh, throughout the, the, the next two, two talks. Uh, so I'll, I'll open it up to questions. Does anybody have any questions? And I have a microphone that I can bring around if you have a question. So <clears throat> whenever you say that they were considered wins, the wins for sports were considered wins for the revolution, what do you mean by that? Was it just a, just a esteem build or? It was validation that their system works, that their system's the better system. Uh, and you know, Cuba enters into, you know, after, after 61 really, uh, enters into a period where they began to export the revolution, uh, export it and support uh, leftist movements and you know, armed conflicts in Latin America and in um, well, basically third world countries, uh, Latin America and in, in Africa. And so when I say sports are being used as a tool for this, it's, it's think of it this way, that you know, when, when Cuba approaches saying, okay, this is the better system, look at what we can do with sports. Look at how we're dominating the Olymp Olympic games or for a country our size, we're outperforming it because of this system. And again, there's, there's a lot of, of other layers to the revolution. Um, you know, they're, they're realizing uh, some of this is reality and some of it is, is kind of the, the myth built around the revolution. Uh, the, the revolution was seen as the, the full realization of Cuba Libre, of, of this, this racial utopia, um, of, of ending you know, social classes and any kind of, of class privilege, everybody is, Everybody is equal um, nationwide. Uh, and uh, if, if you go through this system, the system has success. Uh, but again, there's, there's perception versus reality. Yes, ma'am. So when they won in 1910, you talked about how that affected the Cubans and how they took it as a nation win. How did that affect the United States since we're so tied into football? Okay. Um, okay, that's a complicated question. I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, at this time, college football, football American football generally, uh, was, was mostly local, local interest. So, uh, it drew a lot of interest in New Orleans. It drew a lot of interest in Louisiana. Uh, it drew a lot of interest from LSU because L LSU's football team went to Cuba in 1907 and won 56 to nothing. So it was like, okay, we can do this, but Tulane, our rival, you can't do it. You know, it those sorts of things played out. But overall, it wasn't really seen as um, it wasn't really seen as a, a, a U.S. loss. It was just Tulane team went and lost and. To their credit, the, the, the Tulane news, student newspaper basically said you know, they were better. The Cuban team was better. Now, uh, as in some of the other CAC wins against U.S. teams, uh, you see a lot of familiar excuses like uh, the refs cheated. Um, you know, that's where you're playing in Cuba. It's not going to be on the up and up. That's where they end. Other than, you know, other than, you know, the, the kind of common blame the officials thing. There's another layer of this as, okay, Cuba's corrupt. You can't, you can't expect a fair shake there, no matter what. Uh, so there's that sort of layer on top of, of things later on. But this, uh, in 1910, it was, it was more localized from the U.S. perspective. Okay, we have a question coming in from Zoom that I'm going to read to you.
here's the question. So does it mean up to date the Cuban sport is still under government control? So currently, are Cuban sports still under governmental control? Yes. I can expand, but uh, essentially, uh, yes. It's still, Ender uh, still controls Cuban sports, uh, and it, they're, they're still facing budgetary shortfalls. Uh, and so you see this with a lot of, you know, when you travel to Cuba, you see this a lot in terms of infrastructure uh, that, a lot of the infrastructure that was built or maintained was built, you know, the, the earliest or, or the latest stuff was built in the 70s. Uh, so the facilities that they're training on now, training with now, are, are out of date. Uh, and it's just because of budgetary shortfalls. But yeah, it, Ender still controls Cuban sports. So you started out talking about the 2020 Tokyo Olympics that were postponed to, to next year. And I'm trying to think back about Cuban participation in recent Olympics when all the countries march in with their delegations. And if I recall, Cuba has sent a relatively small delegation to the Olympics in, in recent years. And I'm wondering why, uh, since they're still emphasizing sport, why they don't make, try to make a bigger splash. It's budgetary. Uh, they they try to they pour their resources in into the athletes that have the best shot to win a medal. Uh, it's 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 less about just competing as as you know this this overall you know um, you know goodwill competition. It's the Cuban government and Ender in in the Olympics. They're out for medals because medals validate their system. Uh, and it, in fact. Um, I'm glad you pointed that out because before the revolution, there, there were Cuban athletes who participated in the Olympics, uh, but it was relatively few. Uh, and the, the Cuban Olympic team was not necessarily organized. And in most cases, they were upper class, um, you know, people who, who belonged to social clubs and had the time to train. Uh, and so that changes with the revolution with, with the government investing in sport and controlling sport and, and using it as, as a policy tool. Uh, and so you have, you have greater participation early on and then from the 90s to present, they're, they're trying to pick winners and pouring resources into them. Is baseball still an Olympic sport? Last I checked. And I'm wondering why the Cubans don't send their national baseball team. They, they do. Um, if I remember right, they won the, the gold medal in 92. Um, and they're always, and again, you know, with, with, the Olympic, with Olympic baseball, it's, it's usually the United States, it's usually Cuba, it's usually the Dominican Republic, uh, and you know, maybe Canada, maybe Mexico, maybe Venezuela. Uh, those those, those are, tend to be the best. Um, but depending on the year, baseball comes in and out because baseball is not necessarily a global sport the same way as track and field and that sort of stuff. Right. So uh, the MLB is known for bringing in a lot of Cuban uh, players, right? Um, and I, I know Cuba has had concerns with um, people going from Cuba to the United States and human trafficking. So how does that play into the international relations between the United States and Cuba? Okay. Um, from 1961 going forward, there, there are examples of Cubans immigrating to the United States, and there were periods when that was uh, allowed by the Cuban government. There are several situations where it was allowed and, and it really endorsed, uh, you know, kind of leaving. But by the 1970s, especially with athletes, uh, and this, this is something that's going to happen over time with, with um, you know, from the 60s, 70s, all the way through the 90s, and there's an uptick in the 90s of Cuban athletes defecting, uh, you know, going on international competitions to a foreign country, to the United States, to Canada, internationally, and then leaving, just not, not returning to their, their team, not going back to Cuba. And uh, up until the relatively recently, uh, the Cuban government 
saw this as betrayal, saw this as, you know, saw those defectors as traitors to the revolution and treated them as such. Uh, they, this is, this is kind of Stalinist of them. Uh, they would uh, censor them, them out, especially baseball players, censor them out of sports reports. So if a, a Cuban baseball player was, was prominent uh, in Major League Baseball, they wouldn't appear in Cuban newspapers. Uh, so it's in effect writing them out of the story, uh, right? You know, preventing the Cuban people to see their success in the United States. Uh, and again, early on, there, this, was, this was more the case, but it's, it's been softened here recently. Uh, their coaches were held accountable. In, in a lot of cases, they were imprisoned or, or worse because uh, they were responsible for keeping the, the team together, you know, keeping the athletes part of the team. It's their oversight. Uh, and there were investigations and also trials for people that they considered as uh, co-conspirators for uh, the, the athletes that um, defected. So again, you know, they, they treat them like traitors, traitors to the revolution and, and explicitly said, so, said such that these athletes that, that leave, uh, that, that benefit from our system, you know, raised to you know, international competition and then pursue their own interests are betraying the revolution, betraying Cuba, betraying the Cuban people. Because again, you know, this goes into the mindset that the revolution is, is the whole Cuban people. The whole Cuban people are involved in the revolution. Uh, and so when someone goes against the revolution, they're going against the Cuban people. And recently it's been relaxed a little bit. I know there, well, it's changed. A lot of things have changed in the last four years, um, but uh, there were some relaxation and, and going towards agreements for especially Major League Baseball of, of Cuban players going to, to Major League Baseball and, and still having a formal relationship with Cuba. Uh, not, not being considered traitors, but say, okay, go, go play your season, bring back some remittances uh, to Cuba. We're, we're fine with that. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it kind of goes into after the, the special period, of a general relaxation on their part and up until about four years ago, a uh, relaxation on our part as well. And we have time for one more question. Does anyone have a question? So did we have, when we, I guess, saved the mindset, did we have that when we helped them against the Spanish? And did that have any effect on relations? Oh yeah. Come back at 12. We're gonna talk a lot about that at 12. Um, but yes, uh, there, there are explicit images from the United States, from newspapers, the yellow press, a lot of political cartoons of uh, you know, getting support for U.S. involvement in, in Cuba of, okay, Cuba's the damsel in distress, Uncle Sam's going to go save her, uh, that sort of thing. And from the Cuban side of things, they were not a damsel in distress. Uh, they had fought the Spanish to basically a stalemate and were pretty close to, to bringing them to the negotiating table when the United States came in. So in effect, there's a lot of resentment uh, that, that takes that occurs after, especially after the Platt Amendment, uh, after the passage of the Platt Amendment in 1902 of, in effect, saying, okay, the U.S. stalled or delayed full freedom for Cuba and looked at the United States as, okay, this, we traded one colonial master for another. So there's a lot of nationalist resentment against the United States. And We'll, we'll go into that in more detail at 12. Well, thank you for the first of three uh, excellent presentations. Let's give Michael Wood a final round of applause. Thank you.